Okay, why don't we get started? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Fritz Mayer, the dean here at the Corbell School, and my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, here in the audience and our panelists uh, to our session on From Military Service to Civilian Society, Veterans, and American Democracy. Um, so delighted to welcome excuse me, colleagues and uh, here, students, um, in particular members of DU's veterans community. Um, before we start, just quickly, uh, as we always do, uh, an acknowledgement that we meet on the ancestral land of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations, um, and that we uh, acknowledge the complex and uh, disturbing history um, and legacy um, uh, of, of, uh, of our occupation of this land. Um, and we acknowledge and honor the uh, Native people's elders, uh, both past and present. So let me uh, thank uh, Hoover Institution's Veterans Fellowship Program for partnering with us on, the, uh, on this event, uh, for, to Doug Scribner, uh, who was our, uh, connecting us with all kinds of things but for, for, for being uh, at the heart of this. And also just to say really quickly, uh, we have a wonderful relationship with the uh, Hoover Institution, um, uh, starting with uh, Secretary Rice, Condoleezza Rice, who is uh, surely our most uh, accomplished and famous alum, um, proudly, but also uh, in partnership with Hoover and three other uh, think tanks on the uh, Denver Dialogues program, which is a program of our Scribner Institute of Public Policy here at the Corbell School. Um, part of a whole range of things that we do on democracy uh, and civil society, uh, annual um, uh, democracy uh, summit here. I see Henrik Rasmussen is here, uh, who helped us launch that, so I want to acknowledge your presence as well. Um, uh, and, a, and a number of things around civil discourse, um, um, where we really try to bring uh, all voices to conversations. Um, uh, in this rather challenging time. So we're especially excited to be hosting uh, today's conversation on the unique role of, of veterans in Americans, uh, America's democracy. And we're gonna hear from a wonderful panel uh, of uh, Hoover veteran fellows um, uh, who work on um, in a range of different fields and have distinct perspective on how veterans help shake, shape our democracy at home. Um, delighted that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Lewis Griffiths, will be moderating the conversation. Um, uh, Dr. Griffiths spent the first eight years of his career at the Air Force Command and Staff College, uh, first in the International Security and Military Studies Department, and then for four years as the chair of the Joint Warfighting Department. Uh, he taught the War on Terror Research Seminar, supervising all war on terror related research at the school. Um, and he has an extensive consulting and research um, work centered on policy questions at the intersection of military strategy, utility, and strategic contextual realities. Um, he'll be moderating the panel and then we'll have a chance for Q&A, so um, we'll try to keep this, I think, as interactive as, as possible. Uh, so now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jackie Snyder, Dr. Jackie Snyder, who's a Hoover Fellow and Director of the Hoover War Gaming and Crisis Simulation Initiative, um, who was just finishing a book or just finished a book with our uh, still sort of colleague, Julia, Professor Julia McDonald, I just discovered, which is wonderful. Your uh, research focuses on the intersection of technology, national security, and political psychology with a special interest in cybersecurity, autonomous technologies, war games, and Northeast Asia. She was, uh, you were previously um, assistant professor at the Naval War College, as well as senior policy advisor to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Dr. Snyder is an active member of the defense policy community with previous positions at the Center uh, for a New American Security and the RAND Corporation. And before beginning her academic career, she spent six years as an Air Force officer in South Korea and Japan, and is currently a reservist um, assigned to the U.S. Space Systems Command. Um, she's also coordinating the Hoover Veteran, Veteran Fellowship Town Hall Program, I guess of which this is one of them, which is visiting communities across the country to have discussions centered on the veteran experience. I'm sure you'll hear more uh, from her about that. and. Uh, um, she will introduce our very impressive panelists. So with that, uh, please uh, welcome 
uh, Dr. Jackie Snyder. Thank you. Well, thank you. It is a real honor to be here. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here at Corbell and Scrivener um, because there's a shared value with Hoover, and that's the value of democracy. Uh, our veterans programs are a key element of this value about democracy. So we have a veteran fellowship program, which um, many of our panelists are a part of that veteran fellowship program. What that does is it takes post 9-11 veterans, and they're not just any post 9-11 veterans, they're post 9-11 veterans that have a, a dream, a plan, a belief about how they make their communities and their worlds better. And what Hoover does is they pair that passion, that belief, that drive, that vision um, with resources and make sure that these extraordinary people who did amazing things in the military service can now do amazing things outside of military service. I, I was lucky to serve on the selection committee for this particular fellowship. Um, and for me, it set off a bit of an existential question about who I was and the value of my own service as a post 9-11 veteran. Because as we're looking at these extraordinary people, you start thinking, well, what is the value of these 20 years of combat? Who are these veterans that are now coming of age, who are leading in Congress and in uh, business and in our civil society? And what is going to be the legacy of the people that I served with and that who served after me? And so, as we were having these conversations, we realized that we had an opportunity at Hoover to go out into our communities, and instead of having the conversation insularly, to have the conversation in the communities where these veterans live. So it was a series of town halls all over America where we're looking at the role of the post-9-11 veteran generation in American society. Um, in American society and you know, in the future of the all-volunteer force, in the future of democracy, um, and kind of what, how this particular generation thinks of itself. Um, so these panelists are um, a representation of that conversation. And so tonight we'll be having a conversation specifically about veterans and social capital, how they build relationships amongst each other and then amongst the communities in which they come back to and what that means for American civil society. So with no further ado, I want to introduce our veterans. So um, on our far left, we have Ben Data. Uh, ben is the CEO of Food Maven. And, and before working at Food Maven, um, and he, you have an MBA from the University of Denver, right? So you have like a strong connection here at the university. Um, but before that, he spent seven years as a Marine Corps as an infantry officer. Um, and I won't, I won't hold the Marine thing against you. Um, Claudia began her career even though uh, she was living in the center of Air Force World in Colorado Springs. She actually began her career in the U.S. Navy um, and enlisted as a cryptologist uh, and then became uh, an officer and leading in intelligence um, and is now, uh, she left after 20 plus years of military service, she left to continue her civilian service with the Virginia Department of Veterans Services and has most recently moved into the nonprofit world where she is running her own nonprofit, which is going to be helping post 9 11 veterans. Gil Barndollar is a senior research fellow at um, CSS and a senior fellow at Defense Priorities. And he has a PhD uh, from the University of Cambridge, but more impressive. Uh, spent seven years as a Marine officer and then hadn't had enough pain. And so when he went to academia, decided to join the Army National Guard. Um, and so your ability to navigate, you're the true um, citizen warrior scholar, um, but your ability to navigate all those worlds is impressive. He also has a book coming out that he's working on, on um, America's all volunteer force. And finally, Matt Brown, who also served in the U.S. Navy. I don't know why I like, didn't have any Air Force people here. Um, but served in the U.S. Navy uh, for 12 years. Uh, and he, uh, his career uh, was as a surface warfare officer, which included a variety of different very cool missions, including counter piracy, uh, counter opioids. Uh, you actually did a land deployment in Iraq. <laughs> a pretty extraordinary career, um, but left that extraordinary career to help veterans. And so he has started his own mental health care company, Chimney Trail, um, which aims to eliminate um, anxiety, depression, and suicide um, through
through cognitive behavioral therapy. So these are our extraordinary panelists. Thank you so much for having us here to discuss the role that people like these veterans right here have in the future of American democracy. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to ask five or six sort of questions right off the theme of the flyer and the panel. Uh, and then I'm literally physically coming to you with a microphone. So please don't leave me standing there asking more of my own questions. I'd much rather we heard from you. Uh, and so just raise your hand and I will, I will uh, do my best. For those of you old enough to remember it, Phil Donahue. Uh, or, or Oprah doesn't move as much as Phil, but you get the gist. Uh, I will literally be standing next to you hoping you come up with a question. <laughs> All right, so I want to I wanna start at any all five can comment on each. You can defer to each other. Uh, you, you all know each other and, and have a sense of it. Let me start with sort of an obvious overarching question. Um, we talk about military generations, and we tend to particularly associate them with a particular kind of combat service or, or threat environment. You're all, uh, more or less, as Jackie introduced you, the, the war on terror generation, if you will, of veterans. So what would you, we talk about greatest generation, my father is a member of the Vietnam generation of veterans, and, and there are characteristics, or at least stereotypes. If you had to define for the audience what makes the war on terror generation, what are the characteristics of that generation, what would your answer be? Or is that an unfair question that's, a, that's an unnecessary stereotype? I'll, I'll jump in, okay. Um, I believe you all have microphones. Yeah, that's right. So on, yeah. Uh, I think there's, I guess I would start and just say there's, there's sort of a dual-edged sword in that one thing, at least as far as sustained combat service, and there's a whole downstream conversation about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the um, intensity of those wars, and they certainly weren't Vietnam, let alone World War, World War II. Um, but setting that aside, I think that the, the biggest difference between tr previous generations of veterans that, that fought a war, and I'll, I'll set aside the, the Cold War generation, which, which did tremendous amounts of stuff and really built the all-volunteer force, and that's interesting on its own merits. And, um, but putting aside that generation sort of held the line against a war that ultimately didn't, didn't come. Um, I think the, the post-9-11 generation, or the GWAT, the Global War on Terror, is that acronym maybe fades out of use. Our generation of veterans, the biggest differentiator is that everybody volunteered or maybe more accurately, was recruited, right? Nobody had to go do this. Um, that has a bit of a caveat in that I have one close friend and, and some acquaintances who got told they had to stick around longer than they planned during stop loss in the Iraq war, but that's technically in the fine print of the contract. So you did sign up for that. Um, but anyway, so I think the biggest thing is that everybody chose to serve. And again, the idea that I think AVF is a misnomer, you know, the Army alone has 5,000 generally pretty high performing people spending every waking hour trying to get people to sign up. Um, Ben's been a recruiter, can tell you how the sausage is made. And I, I, my, having not done that job, but I know that that's, um, that can be messy and that's a real process. But everybody did ultimately sign up to serve their country in time of war of their own volition. Um, I think that's significant. The flip side of that is that I think that not always, not in, any, in every case, and not even necessarily in the majority cases, but I think there is a lot of the time sort of a sense of entitlement twinned with that. Um, I think that's the, I think that's sort of the dark side of, a, of an all-volunteer force. Um, and that has, that has some other kind of hangovers, you know, there's a Vietnam hangover that I think kind of reared its head, especially after 9-11, and that, um, you know, the, the sort of thank you for your service thing, right? Um, that we tell veterans all the time they're special. Um, not, you know, we just got that treatment a little bit here. Um, and there's, there's that kind of thing. Uh, and veterans are very much like any other demographic group or interest group are, are sort of carved out from the society as a whole. Um, and I think you can't avoid that. I mean, you're, you've got 1% or so of the population serves, on, uh, serves in the military. Um, and if you look at the majority of American veterans, I mean, the greatest generation is, is there are not many of those folks left. Um, the majority of veterans are not GWAT veterans. Um, but all that being said, you, you, the more you create this cleavage between military veterans, between active duty, but military veterans even more so, um, and American society, uh, I, think, I think that's pretty unhealthy in a democracy. And I think, that's, I think that has a lot of uh, perverse second and third order consequences. Uh, I'll, I'll set it aside here. But I think that the all volunteer nature of the force or all recruited everybody step forward, twinned with the sense of entitlement that, that sometimes breeds and the, and the effects that has. 
So I would like to add to that. I think um, one thing that characterizes this generation, not that it didn't in the past, but um, are two words for me, adaptability and resiliency. I mean, the world changed on 9-11, as we all know. But so did the way we do business in the military. And I'll give you an example. The enemies, so to speak, that we were going up against didn't respect our areas of responsibility. They didn't, they, that's how we were set up. We fought in areas of responsibility, otherwise known as AORs. So all the resources that we put in Fifth Fleet AOR in the Middle East stayed there and was used there. But for some reason, the terrorist organizations didn't recognize our boundaries. And so we had to figure out how to do business differently. And we didn't have a lot of time. The standard operating procedures that we had in place, if you went back to look at, OK, this is how we do that, we had to throw many of those standard operating procedures away and figure it out fairly quickly. Um, how do we? How do we do this? And so I think adaptability and resiliency for this generation really is a hallmark um, that they can carry with them when they become veterans into their communities and their states and the nation. Definitely uh, agree with what Claudia said there and want to echo some of the stuff that Gil said as well. I actually, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one up here, but I actually joined prior to 9-11. Uh, I was commissioned uh, May of 2001. It was at the basic school in Quantico uh, when the towers were hit. Um, and then did spend three years on recruiting duty here in Colorado from 05 to 08. And absolutely completely agree uh, with the piece of, it's yes, people volunteered during World War II and Korea and Vietnam, but they were also augmented by uh, drafts and the rest. Whereas in these battles, it was people who were signing up, going out when they knew exactly what was happening with it. Um, and that also you know, does lead to that sense of entitlement as well. I mean, thank you for your services. Uh, Sometimes one of them are empty, but also two people come to expect it all the time, uh, sometimes when they're vets. And I think that's a, it's a struggle to be able to not fall down that rabbit hole. Um, but now flipping it a bit to positive sides of it, I do think that the type of actions we're involved with, especially as a combat arms, was at a much smaller level than what it tended to be. You're talking about you were having teams that were squads or fire teams, so four people to 13 people that were having to make uh, very complicated decisions that involved civilian affairs and fire support and the rest. And so what you develop from that is a lot of folks who are able to make decisions uh, in very uh, ra uh, rapidly changing dynamic environments. And that's a skill set that I've seen a lot of them uh, then apply once they got out, whether it was running their own business, whether it's becoming part of a larger uh, problem solving entity, whether it's an entrepreneurial organization or a nonprofit organization. And I think you would see uh, when you look at it, there's a lot of vets from the last 20 years who have gone that route because they're used to making the decisions. And, and that's something I think that's unique uh, to this uh, era versus perhaps some of the others. Thank you. Um, so actually, uh, not thank you for setting up the next question. It's always when you write the questions in advance, you're like, I don't know what they'll do with the first one. Um, so here we go. Um, so each of you has made the choice, and in part based on potentially your service, to go into areas in which you can make a difference, the civil society piece. Did you make that choice early on? Do you think that's a product, as you were alluding to, of the particular responsibilities and opportunities and challenges you saw in service? Or is this an extension of the kind of people who join the military and thus want to continue that sort of role, right? Lots of people join the military to, for career reasons, for professional reasons, et cetera. You all joined in a time of conflict and then went on to make a choice to be in the, in the supporting of democracy in the service sector. Do you think they're related or unique to you? I guess I can take that one. Uh, so I, when I grew up, I did not want to be the founder of a behavioral healthcare company. I, uh, that's not, that wasn't my dream. I grew up just south of Annapolis, Maryland, and I wanted to go to the Naval Academy and be a Naval officer for my whole life. I just thought that that's what you did, and it, it definitely is if you grew up south of Annapolis. Um, I got to join the Navy and become a commissioned officer and do all these incredible missions, and I left that, uh, my time on active duty. I was the captain of one of our Navy ships in San Diego, and it was an absolutely incredible tour. Uh, and I rotated from there to go work with our SEAL teams, and about three months into that job, I discovered that 
Uh, my best young officer from my time in command had gone to a Marine Corps exchange and bought a weapon, and he took it home, and he took his own life with it. And it sort of shaped the trajectory of the rest of my professional life. Uh, I think that you'll hear a lot of discussions about behavioral health-related challenges coming out of the post-9-11 generation, and I think a lot of it has to do with it, it, it was a fundamentally different conflict in that I remember most of the time that I was engaged with someone that was theoretically an enemy, uh, we did not hate these people. I mean, I remember uh, responding to a, a, it was an incident at sea, we went up to a fishing dhow, uh, and there were pirates on it, and you think about like pirates as these big, scary, mean people, and they're like 12 to 16 year old kids, and you're like, what am I gonna do with this? And so there is a lot of trauma uh, moral trauma, as they call it sometime in the academic literature, that comes along with fighting these wars that uh, are n absolutely necessary, but are against adversaries that you would definitely not expect. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it is my trajectory, the second half of my professional life is absolutely a derivative of the military service. You know, I, I was gonna say earlier, um, sitting up here with these extraordinary people, um, I have a GWAT medal and I never served in Iraq or Afghanistan. And so my, I always view my career with an asterisk because I spent six years and I didn't deploy. And so when you think about the identity of this generation, I think that is like um, something that we, uh, that can end up creating cleavages within the generations, kind of who um, has served the most, who's been to the most combat tours, who is the true veteran of all of us. But even though I didn't serve in combat, there were experiences that I had, and I was an intel officer, so like, not, not that cool. Um, there were experiences I had that shaped who I am today and my belief in kind of the role that I have now at Hoover and the responsibility I have. And the biggest experience, I was in Japan. I was stationed in Japan when the tsunami occurred. And um, we were up in Misawa, which is the far northern part of Japan. And at the time when the tsunami happened, I was, um, I was back in America, and it took two weeks to get home. And I had about three months left on my assignment there. And in those three months, I spent every single working day on a bus leading airmen to pick up acres, like thousands of miles of, of destruction. We would get on the bus at 7.30 in the morning, and we would show up at the site you know, two hours later, and we'd spend the entire day just picking up wreckage and putting it in piles. And it was, it was the biggest thing I ever did in my career. I mean, I, you know, all these intel things, but it was that moment of service, and that was the ability to lead airmen, and the ability to, and it sh to shape a relationship with Japan, and to do something bigger than myself. And I think that experience has stuck with me more than anything else that I did in the service and has always been in the back of my head behind whatever I do now at Hoover or other places, does this have a larger purpose than me? Is there something that I am doing that makes the world a somewhat of a better place, even if the only way it makes a better place is by picking up trash and moving it to another pile? Not trying to speak for all uh, veterans on it, but I do think some of the commonality is you're there because you want to serve a higher purpose. Um, whether or not you always see that for your day-to-day -day job is always a question. But there's that higher purpose. There's a sense that it's really about the team, the man or woman to your left and right is ultimately why you do it because there's so much other bullshit of being part of the military that you don't like, but those are the people you grow tight with. Uh, and then there's a sense of actual accomplishment of problem solving, of seeing, okay, there's a result from the actions that we take. And then you leave the military and you don't see that anymore. Um, and especially, I think, in today's world where the fabrics of our society do not have those groups, whether it was religion, whether it was a community school, th those ties are not as tight as they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so I do think there's an opportunity for folks of our uh, background that they're searching for that again. And if they can't find it, then they want to try to go out and build it. And that's what leads and one of the reasons why I was so excited to be part of the Veteran Fellow Program. I do think there's a dark side to that as well, is sometimes they can find that same stuff, but maybe not with a positive purpose. Um, and that's definitely something that's a risk with it. But I, I do think that there is part of the shared experience and then actually then removing that, which then can lead a lot of people to try to recreate it and, and try to make a difference with it. So, so actually, Ben, let me build on that. Um, when you made the transition, and, and one of the oddities of my job at ACSC when the department chair was it was a lot of retirement points for a lot of people. So I had this conversation with a lot of individuals 
but you all have toned in a very particular direction. Um, when you transitioned, what networks, what resources, what advantages and or potential challenges did being a former member of the military or, or a transitioning member of the military provide for this group? And what maybe are some of the, to your point, I'll use the phrase dark side, what do you sometimes encounter when out in civil society in the, in the kinds of fields you're working now that are, that are a bit hindrances or things you have to sort of overcome or reassure people? Can I take this one? I love this question. You, you were glowing, yeah. go for yeah. it. <laughs> no, so, so this is, I love this question because, so um, I started a company and you would think when you're formulating your board of advisors that you would wanna recruit flag officer level, general officer level folks, uh, and you discover very quickly that although these folks are supremely talented, they're absolutely brilliant and wonderful advisors in many respects, they have been spoiled children for their entire career in the sense that they have always had a team, a taxpayer funded team. So one of the things that uh, I discovered very quickly after leaving the military service is that you have to earn your team outside the lifelines of the military. Whether it's getting in with a company and becoming part of that core 15% that actually moves the needle or starting your own thing and getting enough momentum and building enough trust in your company to actually have people wanna come and work for you, a lot of times you're alone in the wilderness. Uh, and you have to earn it. Uh, so anyway, that, that's, that like really struck me. And I was like, man, these brilliant folks, and they just don't get it that not everybody is resourced with Uncle Sam. So anyway. So I would also like to comment. I love this question too. Um, and it's actually the focus of my dissertation research on the military transition process because it's a challenging process. Um, when I got when I retired from the military, I was an 05, so that's a senior officer. I had my MBA, um, had 20 plus years of experience, and I couldn't get a job. Um, my passion was policy and legislation. I went to Capitol Hill and I knocked on every door and said, I can do this, I have experience. But they said, but you don't have legislation. And I said, right, because I was a military officer, I wasn't a politician, but I could do this, I can learn this, just give me a chance. And I had no chance. No doors open for me. So I ended up taking a job um, that is considered, the salary was considered below the poverty level in Northern Virginia. But that's the only door that would open for me. So I took it, knowing that if I took it, then maybe I could make my way up further. And I eventually came to the Director of Policy and Planning at the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. So this is a passion of mine, the military transition. I believe that Individuals join the military to serve something greater than themselves. And when they leave the military, that passion does not dissipate. Um, they still wanna serve something greater than themselves. They still need a purpose and a mission, but sometimes they need a little help finding that or getting into the right door or meeting the right folks. And in fact, this year through my policy work, I was able to introduce legislation into the 2024 Virginia General Assembly session to create a veteran legislative fellowship program. And it was rooted from my experience here with Hoover um, so that veterans have an, an opportunity and National Guard members to gain a professional network, get real world experience in policy and legislation and have their careers launched into the public sector. So there's a saying in the entrepreneurial world that uh, the easiest time to raise money is when you don't need it. Um, and I think it's kind of a flip side of this is the best time to build a network is when you don't need it uh, as well. And, and really take this mentality that we try to have here in Colorado of give first and do that as much as you can because that's how you build the relationships that then will be there when you don't even know it. Um, the whole reason I got into the entrepreneurial space was because of a MBA, EMBA classmate of mine here at DU and it was you know two years down the road. Uh, but we had built those connections and then all of a sudden, boom, there's an opportunity. Um, similarly, I had uh, acted as support for a number of my uh, former uh, colleagues that were transitioning, answering a lot of questions, working with them. Well, sure enough, three years down the road, that was who I ended up selling one of our businesses here to in a pretty rough time uh, on it. And, and again, it was building those networks and connections um, and doing so by creating value yourself and then ultimately a lot of times is when it comes back. I can add one piece there. Um, I think there's also the, this, this cultural through line in the military which is mostly healthy but, but sometimes um, bites people in the ass when they get out of the military, whether that's after a four year enlistment or whether that's after 20 plus years. Um, 
And that's that the US military has a, a culture and, and beats its own chest about, but it's largely, you know, certainly pretty good about being a pretty egalitarian place. It, it can be more and less hierarchical, and uh, from the outside looking in, the Navy strikes me as more hierarchical than the Marine Corps, for example, where everybody's kind of in, in the mud and uncomfortable together, or, or more often than not. Um, but that being said, I think, um, I, think there, I think that really does affect veterans, and, and even more so enlisted veterans and officers. Officers get a little bit better at kind of tooting their own horn because of how the evaluation system works. I mean, you tell your boss what you did, on paper, and then that sort of drives that. So there's a little more, there's that divide, but but throughout, and especially on the listed side, people get out and don't realize um, kind of the, both the importance and sometimes very mundane, mundane ways, like Jackie hit on, hit on really meaningful things that um, that don't kind of necessarily make it in a movie. Um, both that or even the basic responsibilities. I mean, I've had conversations with guys, and I say guys as Marine Corps infantry, that was, it was all guys, uh, not anymore. But um, the conversations with guys where they did four years in the Marine Corps, they might have been a great performer, but they look at it as like, I carried a rifle and did knuckle dragger stuff, and maybe I didn't even go overseas. And I say, like, some of the most simple, basic things, usually human interaction things, they say, look, like, you've looked someone in the eye and fired them. There are people that are chief executives or people at powerful places that don't even necessarily have the guts to do that. Like, that's, um, that's a meaningful thing. You know, that's, that's, to you, that's not something you would ever put on paper or even think about. Um, but that's tremendously kind of intangible experience uh, and the skill set that comes with it. So I think a lot, of, a lot of the reason that veterans struggle with transition, even though this country does give veterans tremendous um, entitlements and opportunities, uh, there's a lot there. So, sometimes it's an awareness issue, but um, even if you kind of skate through the transition process, they try to make you aware of what that looks like and what's available to you. The post 9-11 GI Bill, especially as higher education becomes a luxury good in this country, um, that's tremendously valuable, right? Um, but I think that this egalitarianism and this, this very healthy desire to not toot your own horn and to realize everything you did was part of a team can often inhibit um, veterans realizing the gravity of what they've done. You know, I want to take the, the positive aspect that you said and just emphasize for those, there might be a few in the room who could potentially join the military, they're not old like us. I had a great transition because of the military. I had six years of service where I was able to do the most extraordinary things as a 20-year-old, a mid-20-year-old. I mean, my first job was you know, manning the watch in South Korea, and I had to make decisions about whether Kim Jong-un was going to like, well, it wasn't Kim Jong-un, it was Kim Jong-il back then, like whether he was gonna you know, test a nuclear weapon. That's insane, but I was 23. That's crazy, right? The amount of experience, and they paid for it. Guys, I got four years of Columbia paid for. I, they sent me to Milan for six months, and then they sent me back to Florence to learn more Italian. Like, I, I won the lottery in some ways. I had extraordinary experience. And then after six years, I got out and I got a PhD, and I think my work is only better because of my service. And I was also, uh, I got the post 9-11 GI Bill paid for my housing in DC for six years. It was extraordinary. I mean, the other thing I wanna say is, when I was a military officer as a woman, I walked in and my resume was on my uniform. Everyone knew my rank. They knew something about me, about my, my medals, my capabilities, right? That's actually, that's been a transition that's harder. I walk into a room now, I don't have my uniform on. I'm not wearing my resume. It's hard to know who I am. And so what's interesting, talk about egalitarian, I found the military to be a much more egalitarian place in terms of gender than when I left the military. And I think that was actually a bit of a transition for me. I was so confident and used to being treated the same as my male counterparts that um, it was a bit of a surprise going to the Naval War College and being called little lady. And I was like, <laughs> little lady? Um, that would never have happened in the military. So I just wanna say there are great things for people who are considering service. Transition can be hard, but transition can also be um, uh, made more e made easier because of the amazing experiences we get. So obviously, we need to ask a question about democracy, uh, and we need to ask a question about, in fact, what about your engagements and your desire to continue service uh, and make a contribution is motivated by your either concerns from, or, and I want to quote, give General Casey, who teaches a civil military relations class here in the spring, credit for this. I had a conversation with George at one point, and he said, the most important thing I want everybody to understand 
is that people in the military think very seriously and deeply about democracy, even if they're restricted from saying a great deal about politics. So I just thought, I have a fabulous panel here. Let me give you a minute to say what your thoughts are on what might motivate you into joining civil society to improve uh, or contribute to our democracy. Okay, so here's, I'm trying to figure out like if I was sitting in the audience right now, like what the who cares moment is, and this might be it actually. Um, when you are overseas, and let's say maybe one or two of you is considering military service, when you come back, the thank you for your service stuff doesn't really resonate. In fact, there's a really great Curb Your Enthusiasm television show. Has anybody ever watched that? Larry David? There's an awesome episode where like, they're all at a dinner party and one guy forgets to thank the veteran for their service and like the whole party implodes. <laughs> so anyway, that, that is not how you thank someone for their service. Uh, I think the democracy preservation thing is where you can thank folks for their service. When you go overseas and you're fighting to help like these nascent seeds of democracy take root and you're watering basically a patch of ground, not sure if there's actually a seed underneath the dirt that you're watering, you're just praying that these folks are able to, to grow into a, a flourishing democracy and, you and you're like fantasizing at, about home where it already exists and it is the guarantor of all of your freedoms and your family's comfort and all of these things. But then when you come home, and in the news, there's people that would sooner side with Putin than have a difficult conversation with each other in order to advance our common national cause. Like, that is jarring. That really does hit home. Uh, so one of the things, it, like the preservation of the democracy is more about learning how to have conversation again. And, and not, like meeting, not judging immediately and instead meeting people in a, uh, like we're talking about egalitarian, like gi giving folks the benefit of the doubt and coming to the table and having those hard conversations. Let me add a, a kind of a down note or discordant note on this. Um, I don't, I, I would caution anybody that, that, ha that has, you know, no connection to the military from thinking that, that veterans are going to save American democracy. Um, I, would, I would say that the U.S. military, as I said, is, is its own subculture, its own, its own caste, increasingly a family business, and that's a conversation unto itself. But, um, but that, uh, in most, in a lot of important ways, the U.S. military resembles American society for the most part. It's not a total match. There's all kinds of different demographic issues, but it's, but it's a, a decent mirror on American society. All the problems of American society, all the divisions, um, powerful kind of strains of call it what it is, authoritarianism or, or, or inability to really care about that, run through uh, American veterans just as much, maybe even more so in some lanes than in American society as a whole. Um, I mean, you can go back to kind of make maybe the most stark example of this, but you go back to January 6th, you know, call that an insurrection, call it a riot, whatever it was, it was a profoundly anti-democratic explosion, right? Um, pretty much all the big names in that, uh, on that day, or a lot of them were veterans, you know, General Michael Flynn probably should be in jail, you know, and, and was trying to, to get the, President to call out the military to overturn an election. Um, you know, the QAnon shaman was a uh, shaman was a Navy vet, um, you know, kicked out for not taking like an anthrax vax. Um, and Ashley Babbitt, who, who was shot, I mean, justifiably, uh, the only only person killed that day uh, was an Air Force vet who'd been driven, you know, whatever you want to call that, driven nuts or bought into kind of crazy conspiracy theories. So, and then the, the whatever that was later that I think it was that evening or that next day, I think that evening when the House and Senate reconvened to certify the election, I think there were 39 veterans who voted against certifying the election, you know, a, a disproportionate chunk of the, the 140 odd people that did. So, and there, that, that number includes, I think three generals and admirals, it included two, two men who'd given limbs for their country and went out and tried to, after the riot, riot tried to overturn the election. So, all that is to say, I think uh, veterans would be doing a, a you know, would be meeting the mark or doing a fine enough job just policing their own vice providing any outsized contribution to American democracy at, at what I think most of us would agree is a pretty fraught moment. I think one of the really difficult policy pro problems behind the all-volunteer force, so when there was a debate about having the all-volunteer force, this kind of debate has kind of been lost to history a little bit, but one of the arguments against the all-volunteer force was that the creation of the all-volunteer force would basically create a sect of mercenaries. 
and that these mercenaries would uh, kind of be separate of these, uh, separate of democracy, right? They would be their own separate caste. This, this was the argument that was made. And Bob Gates uh, talks about this in the 2010s, you know, as, he, as he was Secretary of Defense and he's thinking about kind of the legacy of the service members that he has been leading at that point. And he said, we have a very complicated relationship here. We must have a functioning democracy to have a functioning all-volunteer force. And so his, his concern at that time was that the amount of amount that that generation of veterans had already given by so few of the percentage of the population was going to make it harder for that group of veterans to come back and be an active participant in civil society and democracy. His concern was that they had built this professional military that was so professionalized that the result of 20 years of service was going to be a decline in democracy. And so I think we're at this kind of pivotal moment where we can, the veterans have an important relationship with both you know, making sure that they become a, a healthy and part of civil society and democracy. Otherwise, not only is it a threat to democracy, but it's also a threat to the professional AVF. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at what you can take for democracy from the veteran experience the most is, is actually the, how do, how do we go about as military members accomplishing the mission? This idea that it, it has to be mission focused, that addition, the idea that you have to be pragmatic, you have to just accept the facts as they are, and then figure out how do we work together to actually accomplish what we want. Because um, I guarantee, I mean, it's, especially if you look at the military in the, the 70s and the 80s, uh, there was so much bipartisanship or par partisanship between the different services that you then saw go away as they started to work together more. And you know, we'd be in uh, firefights where we had uh, Air Force Reserves as our uh, as our close air support, uh, Army coming in on the back up here, and then a medevac coming in from the Air Force side, and all working together because we're aligned around a common mission, good communication, and being pragmatic about what's going on. And there's things there that not just in democracy, but, democracy, but in general, for people to start to adopt and try to focus on to actually accomplish something. I mean, I think that's if you want to look at where the failure in democracy is today. It's the end result of nothing's getting done. I mean, if you look at this Congress, it's you know, the least amount of uh, bills passed uh, ever, uh, I think, is where it currently is at. And you know, if you're on the ground in the military, that just wouldn't be OK. You can't not accomplish some part of your mission. And so I think that's, that's if you want to look at it, that's where we can really take the value from. Excellent. Thank you. Last one for me, audience. So please uh, get ready to raise your hands and, and ask your questions. Um, so I'm in a School of International Relations. I work here. Some of the audience are clearly students. And while they may not wish to serve uh, by joining the military of their countries, um, most of them are motivated to come change the world in some positive way. That's why they're here. So maybe a little more of an anecdotal question. Um, what one thing early in your career did you learn overseas that you would never have thought about, imagined was true? What, what was that sort of cultural moment where you went, Wow, I would never have thought of that. I'm going to go first again. <laughs> All right, so uh, my first job uh, aboard ship was on a US Navy destroyer, and we had this thing called Fruckus, which is where we went with the French, UK, Australians, and Russian navies. This was back, this was a, a, a while ago now, as you can imagine. The Russians were sailing with us, and, we, and everybody pulled into Norfolk, Virginia, and there was a uh, like a team building exercise where all these navies and all the sailors were supposed to go out together uh, and go to Bush Gardens. Does everybody know what Bush Gardens is? Yeah, this is like uh, Virginia's version of like Disney World or whatever. So, so Bush Gardens. So the French, the Australians, the British, they pile in the buses and they fly out as fast as you can possibly imagine. And I was the young officer in charge of making sure that everybody went to Bush Gardens, but I noticed that nobody, off, uh, nobody from the Russian ship was getting off. And so I went up to the quarter deck, which is the area where the person stands to let you on or off the ship. And I talked to the officer that was standing there. And I said, hey, we've already bought and paid the tickets. Let's get the Russians on the, on the bus so they can go to Bush Gardens. Then I'll go. And I said, OK, all right, they're not going to go. Well, why? And they said, well, because we need, uh, we need them to have money for food. And we said, we got money for food. It's all taken care of. The tickets are bought. Just get them on the bus. Let's go. Uh, it didn't get anywhere. He goes and gets the captain. The captain comes down. I explain the same thing. He says, 
I did not go. And I said, all right, sir, uh, I just want to let you just reiterate. Uh, we, we bought everything. It's all bought and paid for. And he grabs me by the shoulder, and he says, and he's like looking at this young officer. He's been in the Navy for a million years. He says, if they go, they never come back. <laughs> and for me, as a 21-year-old kid, I was like, wow, this is a different world. All the kids on the, all the, kids on the ship were like, like we're talking about with pirates. They're like somewhere between 14 to 21 years old. Uh, and we have something special going on in the United States, and we totally take it for granted, and we forget a lot of the times, and all it takes is a 10-minute conversation with a Russian Navy captain to know what you're missing. So I had ex an experience that um, kind of stuck with me. We were in Panama, and we were out in the jungle area where folks really weren't living like we live in the United States, obviously, and we went into their little huts where they lived and they didn't have any beds. And so one of the efforts that folks thought was, great, we'll make beds for them so they'll have beds to sleep in. So they literally made beds, um, brought them into the houses and thought, now these people will be happy because now they have beds. Went back a few weeks later, the Panamanians had taken the beds apart and built uh, instead, they wanted to build a stand for their stereo or whatever radio equipment they had. So they didn't want the bed, but they did want the stereo stand. And it struck me that if we're going to help other nations and other cultures, it's not always helpful to come with our American mindset and think that, I know what's best for you, so let me build you a bed. <laughs> we may have to really work hard to understand different natures and different cultures and different backgrounds in order to truly help them. So don't mean to go dark with mine, but um, it's, about, it's talking about the democracy side of it is, especially when you're younger, sometimes it can seem like, oh, what happens in Washington, what happens at the presidential level and the rest is so far removed from my day-to-day -day life, like I'm, it, it's just not gonna affect me. And uh, even as, you know, through the military, doing the first uh, deployment, initial invasion to Iraq, you know, I still kind of felt that, like you're so far removed. Uh, but then my second deployment, uh, we ended up uh, having the luck of replacing the 82nd Airborne in Fallujah uh, in, a, in March of 2004, uh, and then was there for when the Blackwater contractors got hung up on the bridge, and then that exact day, we're sent in to go try to take care of this. And obviously, it uh, was a pretty rough time overall for about a, about a month, month and a half, but then ultimately, as you have three battalions online ready to push in, You've already lost a number of your fellow Marine and, and, and Navy and other military members in this uh, battle. Um, it is at the presidential level that they decide to yank you out. And to all of a sudden feel that string as close as it can be, it just makes you realize how important it is that we all participate in, in that whole experience because if it's not you, it's somebody else who is ultimately on the end of that line. And so it's a, that was just one for me that was a real uh, just eye opener more than anything else. Yeah, I would say that I think the, the number one thing I took away from um, probably my time in uniform in general, certainly as far as international relations and, and U.S. foreign policy goes, uh, and was brought home to me very early in the first Afghan deployment, and this would have been the end of 2011. Uh, it was just the limits of American power. I mean, um, I came to the military in kind of a weird fashion. Went to graduate school first, had to have uh, ankle surgery, so I came in older, which was probably good. And by the time I came in. Um, it was pretty clear the Iraq war was a disaster. It was hard to believe that had been, that any of that was gonna produce anything healthy, but Afghanistan was still kind of the good war. This is 2009, 2010 timeframe, right? Uh, and so when I went over as a platoon commander with a Marine Light Armed Reconnaissance Unit, which is like the Marine Corps' version of cavalry, so you're rolling around in, in vehicles, um, and we had responsibility for this utterly, I mean, it was described to me as the, the West Virginia of Helmand Province, which, which is, and Helmand Province is the most remote and sometimes the most violent part of the whole country. You know, the illiteracy rate was upwards of 80%, um, just opium poppy farms as far as you can see, and, and that was sort of that. I mean, it's like stepping back into the 13th century, except there's motorcycles and, uh, and AK-47s, but otherwise you could be in medieval Afghanistan. Um, and so we had this uh, company was spread out, and we, we basically were providing, providing security or pacification or sort of governance support or pick your kind of phrase to um, this, this rural, illiterate stretch of Afghan kind of river valley. Um, and it was, it was clear that we were just sort of tourists. We're kind of passing through. You know, they'd seen American faces every six months for a couple of years now. Um, they didn't really take anything we said too seriously. They knew the promises of their government, which was 
our money funding their government was kind of illusory. Um, and I won't give you the whole long story, but, but one of our, our signal achievement in a couple of months in this area before, of course, we packed up and went somewhere else was to build this school, this little one-room schoolhouse for this Afghan village because ostensibly that's what they wanted. Um, and we built this thing where the, the cliff notes is we built this, they immediately told us they didn't, they'd never wanted that. Because with Taliban had come in the night and told them like, hey, you're not sending your kids to this American-built school. Um, to add insult to injury, we built it with local contractors to stimulate the Afghan economy. They built it in a fashion that was extremely unsafe. I mean, I, I'm a history major who's never built anything more complicated than a sandcastle. And I told my boss, like, I don't think this is good. Like, I would not put kids in this room. <laughs> and he, like, he kind of, not a bad guy, actually, Colorado guy. He, uh, he kind of poo-pooed and then came out with me. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, this is off limits. Like, and so uh, in this, I mean, you would swear this is something out of, like, a war novel. Before we could get the bureaucratic processes moving and get the, get the Marine Corps to send an engineer unit to bulldoze this thing so no kids died playing in it, the Taliban blew it up. And this was, like, 500 yards from our, from our patrol base. Um, they did us a favor. I mean, they saved the American taxpayer $10,000 or something. Um, but, but seeing that in action in, in what was, again, a real, this is a permissive, this was peaceful in our entire three months there. Nobody got shot at. Um, you know, it was a quiet, peaceful, remote, kind of almost like a throughway to real battlefields further north. Um, and realizing that we couldn't even build, couldn't even build, never mind, secure uh, a, a one-room schoolhouse. And then to come back to Washington, a, a, you know, half a decade, a decade later, uh, and literally sit in, I remember just this strong memory of sitting in the Four Seasons for this benefit gala a few years ago, and there was a senator and a now presidential candidate talking about, literally said you know, verbatim, a lot of Americans don't understand why building schools in Afghanistan makes them safer. And I just, you know, I, I just sort of sat there. I, did not, I don't think I was laughing at it. I just sort of said, this is absurd to sit here and listen to this. So the, the limit, and you get built up, especially in the Marine Corps, I mean, prior to this Afghan deployment, you you do big, pretty expensive, and pretty pretty good level of training, and you do very, you know, you, you call in bombs, you blow things up in the desert in California, and you get to see sort of what that fist of American power looks like, and it feels pretty good, uh, and you go over there and realize you, you can't necessarily even control what you can see. My experience in uh, South Korea and Japan, and so it's very different, because my relationship, these were relationships with allies, not with adversaries. And so I did see the power of American soft power in Japan. I saw how that alliance strengthened after uh, Americans helped with the tsunami. And I saw a lot of positive engagement there. So I mean, there are, but there are examples of how our relationships with different countries and alliances can build really positive, um, positive movement in the world. Um, so I, I hope, I just want to leave a little positivity. After. <laughs> All right, uh, who would like to ask a question? Hi, um, I'm Martin Rose, I'm a professor here. Um, I'm here because I have lots and lots of military students. Um, we've had a lot of people come through our doctoral program, for example, who have gone on to, to work in the military academy. And I'm, kind of, I'm always puzzled about the variety of transitions. So, you know, <coughs> you spoke about how fantastic the military had been in supporting your um, post-military career, going to university and so on. Our students are following that kind of path. But on an everyday basis, I drive around Denver, and a lot of people who seem to be struggling and homeless and begging on the street corners are former vets. Why does the veteran service fail those people? Uh, you, you're going into you're going into healthcare, behavioral health, health, and so on. And obviously, one of the reasons you're doing that is because the vet, veteran health administration can't do the whole job. And so, I, so I assume that there are people like you <coughs> elsewhere with other organisations who are trying to pick up the slack. But what what is it about the veterans administration, the veter, veterans health service, that means that some people are going in, in a bad trajectory versus people like yourself who have this incredible support to go forward in your, your post-military career? So I think, I mean, one of the things that you probably have taken away so far is that the military is a microcosm of society in general. And I think that Jackie here is like an all-star no matter what team you put her on. So you can, uh, <laughs> you can pretty much guarantee she's gonna land on her feet. Uh, the same cannot be said for every uh, American veteran. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll just put out is that there is a lot of folks that um, they, they speak poorly 
of the VA, and the VA is some of the best healthcare in the world. They are absolutely outstanding. The limiting factor is getting someone successfully enrolled in the VA. Once you're in there, the healthcare is first rate. It's getting somebody actually in the door. Uh, so Chimney Trail Health does that to a certain extent, but not really. I think Claudia is actually probably gonna be doing more of that in the transition from active to uh, veteran life. But, but really I think it's just important to remember that every veteran you meet cannot be cut from, that they're not, they may have worn the same uniform, but they come from very different backgrounds. And a lot of them brought trauma into the service and they leave with that same thing. We try very hard, the Marines got a great saying, it's like we, we'd like churn out better citizens than with, that one came in, right? So the idea is to like return everybody to society a better version of themselves. And in a lot of ways they do that, but, um, but some people are just better uh, equipped to handle it than others. And so I think as a society, we have to, I don't wanna say like meet at the lowest common denominator necessarily, but there need to be on ramps for this incredibly rich VA experience uh, that are more easy to navigate. It reminds me that the World War II generation was just invited to participate in VA health just recently, like a month, two months ago, something like that. And I, I was like, you know, what 80 plus year old person wants to navigate the bureaucratic intricacies of the Veterans Health Administration or VA, but uh, we need to do that for, for everyone. I, I think also there's been significant improvement in, in how both nonprofit and government support veteran transitions. Like if you look at folks I know who really did struggle with transition, some quite um, catastrophically, um, that was the beginning. It was, you know, the 09s, the 2010s, the very beginning. Um, there were not options that I think there are now. So that's one. The other is that, and I wish we had, one of our veteran fellows actually runs the veteran portfolio of the Heinz Foundation. And so she's done a lot of work trying to characterize the needs of the 9-11 veteran generation versus the Vietnam veteran generation. And she says that actually the homelessness is a much bigger problem with the Vietnam veteran generation than this newer generation. And so there are kind of unique needs for each of these different generations of service. And I, I wish she was here because she could speak more authoritatively about, uh, about that. But I think the homelessness um, uh, is potentially more of a, a later or an earlier generation of veterans. That's not to say that this generation doesn't have problems and issues. Um. And one of the one of the interesting aspects to consider is the difference in culture between the military cultural environment and the civilian cultural environment. Of course, you're a civilian before you join the military, so you think. I'm gonna be a civilian again, that's gonna be great, but in between that, you've been socialized into a military culture, which is, can be starkly different from the civilian culture. It's one of camaraderie and unity and teamwork and mission first and structure and hierarchy. And then you transition the civilian culture, which can be more individualistic um, at times, less cohesive, less unity, not always, but often. And so for veterans who've identified with a military culture and find their identity in that, when they transition to the civilian culture, they're not, they're not sure who they are anymore. And so it's a struggle and they can get caught between two worlds. Not that you can't overcome that, you can, but a lot of times what they need is a supportive veteran community around them and whether that's student veterans at a university um, that can support them. Sometimes all they need is just a supportive community. They just need to find a few other veterans to, to continue that camaraderie with. So. It, there's really two big gaps uh, that I see and the, the one Claudia hit on a bit before and I had a similar experience to hers where I really took what I thought was a step down from my first civilian job because it was my, the only way to get my foot in the door. I have a degree in mechanical engineering from Notre Dame and was a Marine Corps officer for seven years. A lot of our prior, a lot of our enlisted, especially junior enlisted, they're coming out, they have a high school diploma, that's probably it. And then they have incredible skill set, but they don't know, and I forget, I think it was Gil who said it before, is they don't know how to translate that necessarily to what they need. 
And so the more programs that can be out there that provide that open door for them to make that first transition, they're going to excel and they're going to go on and do great things. And there's certain companies that do it. Home Depot's one. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple others, but there's there are companies who help that. But that is one of the big gaps out there. And then the other one that I think is real and, and the work that Matt's doing is incredible on it is the, the mental health problem uh, on it. Is there definitely is again I want to say if it's worse than any other generation, but definitely a very impactful side on that. I mean, out of our company of 130 Marines, uh, we've lost 10 to suicide. Uh, and, and a lot of this was six, eight, 10 years later uh, on it. But um, that, that is still definitely a thing. And a lot of times that is because of that lack of community piece of it. They find themselves, you know, one uh, was here in Colorado, he ended up in a small town up in the mountain by himself with no uh, type of support there. And so figuring out how do we make sure that veterans maintain those community connections and, and that and that support system going forward is, is a key thing. So uh, my name is Brian Henry. I work in the Office of International Education here. Um, I am from West Virginia. <laughs> um, but also, um, so my family goes back from World War I, World War II, Korea, uh, Vietnam. And then I spent a few years in the Air Force and the Army National Guard myself. Um, so I joined 2004 after 9-11, right? Uh, similarly to many of you. Um, I feel like 20 years ago, right? I feel like the world has changed. The country has changed in many ways. Um, and I've heard a lot of discourse, and I've heard a lot of discussion on the direction that the nation is going as we talk in a current election year. Um, so my, my interest from you all would be is, do you think it was worth it? Was your service worth the time into where we're le had leading our country? This is the question that motivated this entire town hall series is I wanted to, in a small way, give our generation an opportunity to have that conversation. It's a tough conversation. I remember I, I signed my um, papers for ROTC on September 10th, 2001 in New York City. And the next day, the world changed. But there was a simplicity of purpose in those years. You, you believed what you were doing had this kind of bigger, I mean, it was just, it was easy to, it's more complicated now because we, we look at the end of Afghanistan and Iraq and we say, these things we believed and the reasons why we signed up and what we thought we were doing in 2004 and 2005, it's more complicated now. So I don't have an answer, but what I want to say is, <laughs> I think this is an important conversation and I think sometimes we're scared of having this conversation. It's okay, it's okay if this is complicated. It's okay if we, we're not sure. It's okay, and I think what I want out of all of this is for people like you and me and everyone sitting on this panel to be able to say, I don't know. I don't know, but it's okay because the things I learned about myself and about the people I served with are good enough that I can go back to American society and make it better. And that's what I want the legacy of our generation to be, not whether Afghanistan and Iraq were foreign policy successes, in many ways it was completely out of our control, no matter how good we were tactically or operationally. But instead for the legacy to be, these were extraordinary people that served at an extraordinary time and now they're back and they're coming of age and they're gonna do extraordinary things in America. Yeah, I think you're selling yourself short on, on that one, Jackie. Is I, I think you can answer it is individually, and I'm guessing everybody up here feels the same, it's a hell yes. Um, because of what I learned, the, the uh, relationships I built, um, and what I feel I now am driven to do going forward. Um, strategically, even operationally, I mean, I think we all know most of the answers to those ones there, but ultimately does that really matter and does that take away from what I think I've done for making a difference going forward? Um, and, and even so, just more than anything else, the relationships I've built and the people I know, um, I would do it again. Yeah, for me, absolutely. Um, I still believe in this nation I still love this nation, and I would do it again. Um, you don't have to join the military to serve this nation. You don't have to join the military to make this nation a better place. But the one thing I would hate for folks to do is to give up. So absolutely. So go ahead. I can hop in. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a great question, um, and, and no disrespect to West Virginia. I think it's gorgeous, and I sneak out there from D.C. sometimes. Um, but uh, I, I think that... For me, it would be a yes, but maybe a guilty yes in the sense that I think, I think the I think the ends do matter, and I think the fact that um, you know that when you actually do the polling for whatever that's worth, 
slightly more veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan think they weren't worth it than the civilian population as a whole. So those numbers are pretty close, but it's, but it's a clear majority in the case of both wars. Um, those, ends, those ends do matter in the amount of, of lives ruined, you know, Americans and then far greater number of people overseas, I think that really matters. Um, and I, I try not to view it through the lens of, of self-actualization because I just think, you know, like that, um, I got really lucky. I served, you know, two combat deployments, seven years on active duty, went to some other countries, served with a great group of people, was very lucky that, um, that didn't, all my Marines came back with life, limb, and eyesight. Um, and that's, I could, you know, you can pat yourself on the back and say whatever, but that's mostly luck. Like, a lot of this stuff is pure circumstance. Uh, you can literally think about somebody got shot lower and had it been a foot higher, it would have been in the throat, right? Um, so so I, I think that the, um, thinking that of how it affected me, I had extremely positive experience through pure good fortune more than anything else. But um, I ultimately believe in the obligation. I think it probably should be an obligation, and we will get to that point if we ever have a real meaningful national security crisis. But I believe in, in the, that if you're a healthy young person in democracy and you have the kind of personality that, that can handle that um, and, and are physically and mentally healthy, you probably should serve. Um, so I look on it more as, as an obligation, something you should do, um, regardless of both the benefits to yourself and or the benefits to the, to the world writ large. So we're going to get a little greedy with time because we started a little late. So I'm going to take one more question. And then after I'm, that question is done and you've given your answers, I'm going to hand the microphone to Damon Vine, our, our veterans coordinator here at the university, to wrap us up. Uh, I want to say personally thank you very much for a fabulous conversation. Sir. Well, I was going to ask a question, but just make a contribution on this discussion about the veterans' health benefits. So I happen to have the personal insight that a niece uh, decided to work as a physician at the Veterans Administration. And the problem she tells me about is we've got so many people in Washington writing rules thinking they can do medical diagnoses that you, they, they somehow think you can distinguish between a service-connected and a non-service-connected problem. Uh, and so she said her primary task as a supervisor of other physicians is to always sign off, yes, this is service related to try to help somebody. Yeah, there's, there's so many, holy mackerel, we need a whole nother panel to discuss uh, defense, like um, health benefits and that sort of thing. But uh, so you'd say your daughter or your niece, your niece. Okay, so thank you for her service. Like that's, a, that's, a, that's service in a very important but different way than the folks that are sitting up here. Uh, one of the things that we run into with military connected service, disability, whatever the case might be, is that we call it disability as folks leave the service. And what it really is, is a prorating on your health insurance payment. So if you were to go into the open marketplace as an 18 year old, certainly if I was 18 again, I would not have any of the various things that are wrong with my body right now. And I would pay uh, appropriate premium for that very like reasonably fit body, I should say. So. Uh, after some period of military service, regardless of what it is, you're entering the marketplace for health insurance at a much later point in the stream and your premium is gonna go up. And so the VA disability payment helps to offset that in some way. Now there's some you know, calculations that they do in order to like um, compensate you in other ways. Uh, but whether or not it's service connected, like what she's doing is essentially giving somebody the opportunity to have a prorated health insurance premium when they when they enter the, the marketplace. Because here's the, the secret that's not such a secret, is that most folks don't retire from the armed forces. I mean, if you retire, then you're a TRICARE beneficiary for the rest of your life, and it's wonderful insurance and everything's great. Um, you, you're certainly a benefit, you're a beneficiary of the VA, uh, but most people supplement that. So, I, I mean, I don't know if that's, it's not an answer to a question or anything, but it's, um, I think much needed perspective. You, you hear people talk, that person's 100% disabled, but they just ran a marathon last week. What they mean is that that person has 100% of the prorating that you can get to offset their insurance premium. But that doesn't sound nearly as cool. So. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Jackie, may I hold it against you that whatever your branch of service is, and I won't hold it against any of you that you're all officers either, so. 
Uh, my name is Damon Vine. I'm the Director of Veterans and Military Resources at DU, um, and I was asked to give some remarks on student veterans at DU. But before I do that, I'd like to make two notes. One, I'm a terrible millennial, and what that means is I type up a Word document for a speech today, and then I get to my computer and it's gone. So the other thing is, if you've heard me talk, I am not a loquacious person, so I will not take up too much of your time anyways, so it's a win-win for everybody. <clears throat> um, like I said, my name is Damon Vine. I'm the Director of Veterans and Military Resources. I've been with the university since 2015. Um, in that time, I have seen a lot of growth. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a OIF, OEF veteran, deployed three times, once on the USS Theodore Roosevelt, twice boots on ground to Iraq and um, Afghanistan with Naval Special Warfare Group 2. So, <clears throat> after getting out of the Navy, I pursued my history degree. Um, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I spent about a semester in class with 18 year olds. I said it gets worse as get, they get younger. I'm not doing that. Um, found myself here um, doing this work and have found great pleasure in that. The best part of my job is occasionally I'm asked to speak on what veterans do at the University of Denver. And we do some truly amazing things here. Everything you folks have talked about, our student veterans are doing on a daily basis. So when I got to DU in 2015, we had a, an SVA. We had many SVAs. What we did is uh, Dr. Keith Miller over here and I worked hard to consolidate down, that down into two. So we have a law school and a quarter semester, quarter system SVA. Um, what they've done is they've implemented programming at DU. Almost everything we do at the university is student veteran led. That's with intentionality because what you folks are talking about is how veterans take the reins. And what we wanna do is show them that what we're used to in the military is hey, you screwed this up, or hey, I need this, give it to me. That's totally different out here. It takes a long time to learn, so our student veterans are doing that. They've established the DU Hero Games, so it's a community engagement event where we take four branches of service and take their special forces exercise and ask our community to come out and participate in those with us. We also have, um, starting just last week, we initiated the Omega, Delta, Sigma, Fraternity, and Sorority, so we will have the fifth in the nation um, veteran fraternity and sorority. This year, our uh, student veterans also are initiating the first ever military, veterans and military ball at the University of Denver. So that will be a big event um, for them. General Casey will be speaking, so our Provost Mary Clark. These are all things that our student veterans are doing. They're building their toolbox here at the University of Denver to take those skills into the civilian world. Um, there was a professor here that asked a question about um, homeless veterans and veterans struggling. I'm gonna take that opp this opportunity to brag about the University of Denver and say we have programming, not just in the Veterans and Military Resources, but on the south end of campus from the STERM, uh, from the Graduate School of Professional Psychology called the STERM Center. They see veterans, active duty service members, and reservists for free if they qualify. That is a mental health support for veterans on campus and in the community. We also are home to the Rocky Mountain Veterans Advocacy Project out of the Sturm College of Law, where they help veterans. Um, is the the uh, director is Brad um, Bishop, and he um, oversees students who help veterans get their benefits reinstated. So some of the reason that those veterans may not be using the VA is not because they don't want to go to the VA, because the VA is an excellent service. I go to the VA myself. They don't know how to access it, or they have a discharge that doesn't allow them to. The University of Denver is helping those veterans to the best of their ability access those benefits. So we have many things going on at this institution, which I'm very proud to be a part of, and very proud to take this opportunity to talk about. Um, like I said, I don't talk very long, and I talk fast when I'm nervous. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards. I'd love to, to talk to you folks about what we're doing here at the University of Denver for veterans and um, active duty service members. Thank you. Let's everybody thank the panelists. Also thank the folks in the uh, Shrivener Center for running this, Katie in particular, and thank our Hoover Institute partners.